A very good morning, good day, wherever you may be joining us in the world. You don't need me to tell you how bad the situation has been for the uh, hospitality, the travel industry, and indeed how we're at an inflection point now for how the rest of the year will go, the Northern Hemispheric summer season and the position of the haves and the have-nots when it comes to vaccinations. But the panel that we're going to talk about this morning is not so much focused on how to get the tourism industry restarted. It's, <coughs> excuse me, it's much more about protecting the workforce and recovering the 100 million jobs that have already been put at risk, if not lost. How do we ensure that those jobs are not gone forever? Or since we know that there's a pent up demand for travel and tourism, how can we ensure that they come back as fast as possible? And to do that, we need both government policies, which is why we're delighted to have Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne, the uh, French Minister of State for Tourism, French nationals abroad and Francophonie, who, who joins us and will give us that perspective from a country that is still, uh, st still fairly buttoned up has the largest number of tourism, normally in a given year, tourism arrivals, and will be now working out when and how it can move forward. Mark Hoplomatsion is the CEO of Hyatt Hotels Corporations. It'll be interesting to see, Mark, and what I want to hear from you particularly, are the policies that you found work from government in terms of being able to keep hotels moving the stimulus that you now require and the skill set of people you require. Can you reopen? And talking along that, Shirley Tan is with me. Shirley is from Rajawa Wali Group, Property Group. Shirley runs, uh, is the CEO. Um, the wonderful, beautiful properties that you have, Shirley, that you will tell us about, but they're in a country that has not yet fully reopened. In fact, reopening is still underway. And the idea of foreign nationals arriving is in any large numbers is some way off. So from you, I want to hear what you want from government in terms of grants, help, support, how you think you can continue your development program. And finally, Paul, ah, always good to have Paul with us, the CEO. <coughs> Dubai airports. Now, I've been through Dubai. It's prepared and it's moving forward. But Dubai airports has unique issues and challenges, which Paul will discuss with us, the size and scale of it. But also, Dubai promises to be the, the melting point, if you like, between the, the vaccine haves from the developed world and the vaccine have-nots from the developing world. And they will all be meeting up in the concourse of Dubai Airport in the middle of the night. You get the idea. Before we begin, let's have e hear from each of you. Minister Lemoyne, before we came on, I was just looking at the current policies that France has in place, which essentially means the tourism industry, even domestic tourism, because of the 10 kilometer rule, even domestic tourism is a non-starter for the foreseeable future. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, for uh, um, your moderation uh, for, for this uh, round table. Uh, so, uh, of course, we are uh, in a kind of uh, lockdown, uh, I would say, uh, uh, because we have uh, this uh, uh, measures uh, that uh, uh, don't allow us to, to, to go uh, uh, far uh, from these uh, 10 kilometers. But uh, we are uh, preparing, uh, I mean, the reopening, because uh, we must uh, provide uh, our professionals uh, some perspective. Uh, it's essential. And um, uh, so we are going this work uh, now um, uh, in order to, uh, to give them uh, uh, I mean, in a few days, uh, uh, so, some perspective, because they, 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 
the, the need uh, to, uh, um, I mean, to train the people uh, yeah. to go back to work. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, also uh, why we, we, we took a decision uh, just, uh, ju ju just uh, yesterday uh, to uh, say to the, uh, to the companies that they could, um, uh, they could uh, hire, employ uh, the workers and put them in um, partial uh, activity right. if needed. That means uh, if uh, there is no possibility to, uh, to work, uh, they will be uh, reimbursed 100% uh, by the state and the worker uh, continue um, earning 84% uh, of its uh, uh, income. So it's, it's essential to um, uh, maintain, uh, I would say the know-how uh, to maintain uh, the workers, even if they cannot uh, work uh, by now. Do you, do you, Minister, do you think that there will be any meaningful tourism possible in France this summer. Can you see by, I, I, and I understand at the front end, that will be very difficult, but at the back end of August and September, can you see that possibly? I, I, I'm quite uh, comfortable with the fact that uh, this summer, uh, we will have a summer in France and we will be, we will be able uh, to welcome um, some, some, some tourists uh, uh, coming from the European Union, I think. Uh, for other geographies, uh, we must see how evolved the pandemic and how other countries assess the European Union uh, also as a, as a spot, uh, I mean, in terms of, of the pandemics, uh, because sometimes uh, it's very difficult, uh, I mean, for example, for Americans or, or for Chinese uh, to come back in their own countries uh, due to some restrictions uh, coming from the European Union. Yeah. But uh, I think that uh, our uh, main engine, I would say, for the, uh, the touristic activity uh, is uh, people coming from the European Union. It's uh, 36 percent uh, of our uh, international visitors. Uh, that means it will be uh, a first engine uh, that could uh, uh, that could uh, work again. Right. And we'll talk about that when we talk about um, <clears throat> travel passes and the green pass and the like. Mark, but Hyatt, um, we, we're going to focus as we go through this on this skill set. From from Hyatt's point of view, and I recognise. We're talking many different countries, PPP in the United States. You're talking about payroll uh, plans in the UK, things like that. What have you found to be the most effective form of government support across the, uh, across the globe for Hyatt to be able to maintain your core structure? Um, thanks, Richard, and thanks for having me uh, as part of this panel. Um, there are a couple of programs, and you mentioned one of them just now, uh, the PPP program, the so-called Payroll Protection Program, um, was designed to provide uh, grants to companies that were in dire need, and most of the travel sector was and remains in dire need at this point. Um, but it was really meant to be directed to uh, compensation for people that you were bringing back or retaining um, during a period when demand didn't justify the staffing. Nonetheless, um, that was limited in its application and the, um, the, impl the implementation left um, something to be desired in our industry, in the hotel industry, because of the structure of the industry. Mm -hmm. the, the brands, the brand management companies like ourselves employ a lot of the employees, but they're paid for by an owner of a hotel and that mismatch in the record of the employer caused a lot of um, friction in the in the early stages of the PPP. So that's one that's one program that was partially effective. The employee retention uh, credit, which is a tax credit, was highly effective um, in helping companies afford to retain employees. Um, I do believe that the the program that the French government actually implemented, which the minister just referenced, has been highly effective because the key in, in our situation is if you can remain, retain connectivity to those who had been furloughed or, or laid off, that is a wonderful foundation for reemployment in the future. 
And we, we've tried to do this through private means, meaning we, we set up a app-based communication platform to try to maintain communications and connectivity with people who we had to let go over the course of this past year. Um, but that, you know, I, I think it, in, the, in the case of what, what the French program did, it allowed companies to continue to maintain that connectivity while they got reimbursed for a portion of, those, of that compensation. I think prospectively, um, the, the, we're not out of the woods yet. And um, I think that there are, uh, there's the potential for us to have a couple of um, uh, pullbacks. It's, I, I pray that that's not gonna be the case, but it's possible. And I think other employee focused um, aid and um, uh, from the government is, is, is almost certainly required in soon. Just give us an idea before I come to Shirley, just give us an idea, Mark, what percentage of your hotels worldwide are open now, do you think? Um, we have a thousand hotels around the world and we have 34 that have remained unopened. Um, wow. And, and uh, occupancies have been, have been improving over the course of this year, um, but we're still operating below 50% of where we were a year, uh, two years ago. So it's still at a very, very low level of, um, of occupancy. I'll just add one other key thing, and that is even during this period of time, the last uh, three months when we've seen occupancy rising, we've had an extremely difficult time bringing people back to work or, or get, getting people to take jobs. And in the case in the United States right now, the extra unemployment benefits plus these stimulus checks have left people thinking, and the reality is that they can actually make as much money as uh, by being unemployed as going back to work. And as a consequence, restaurants, hotels, um, quick serve restaurants, we are all having a very difficult time hiring people right now. I, I don't want to take us down a political road, but that was, was one of the issues that was mentioned in uh, during the debate in the United States. And what, I, what I'm hearing from you is that that is actually a, a, a legitimate concern. It is. It is. And Look, I think um, the, 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 the intentions were very good and right. it felt very urgent, uh, but unfortunately it's having an a unintended um, detriment uh, at this point. Mark, I want to go to the other side of the coin of what you were talking about in terms of the, the, the management and the brand versus the owner of the property. Shirley's with us, uh, Shirley Tan. Um, so you're in a, a, a difficult position. You've got beautiful properties in beautiful parts of the world. Tourism isn't open really yet. And it's unlikely that you will get decent numbers before the end of the year. Will you be able to keep all the properties? Yeah, uh, thank you, Richard, and um, uh, for having me here. And yeah, you're extremely right. Um, we, we went through this uh, when the pandemic happened into a situation of extreme liquidity strain and very limited cash flow. And, and we are thinking that this is going to be the last to recover, right, with the ongoing travel restriction and global recession. So in the first wave, when domestic tourism coming back, uh, when um, like just for one or two months, uh, when there is a bright spot of optimism, um, there is a surge in domestic demand with some of our hotels achieving almost like 70 to 90% occupancy. But that happens for less than a month. So we close back our hotel again. So there's just this opening and closing, opening and closing and opening and closing situation they are going through in some of our hotels. Shirley, just can you, for, uh, as, a, as, a, as an operator, sorry, as, a, as an owner, are you more in favor of keeping it open and lowering the rate or holding the line on the rate and if necessary, closing the hotel? Well, we run a situation to look at how our cash flow saving is going to be like in the case of opening and closing and with a very accurate forecasting, looking at uh, how the pandemic situation is going. So as of now, uh, we, we prefer to open all our hotel as most of them are really in the range of 20 and 30% occupancy. And we could still keep the hotel going uh, with rather minimum uh, uh, with very minimum occupancy. So rather than just fully closed. Um, the, the, the policy that I feel very helpful for us to retain most job is really the, the, the common uh, loan monitorium 
uh, the governments are giving some cash grant if you retain your employees and a certain tax reduction. So these are the things that really stop the bleeding uh, extensively for a while. But there are some one or two countries that come out with some policy like Singapore. And one of the policy that um, the, the government is actually the net, um, they buy out a lot of hotels for stay home notices right. and uh, prepaid. Um, so, so they'll tell the hotel to keep it going. And some in order to boost domestic tourism begin to set up tourism fund. Uh, that give vouchers for staycation. So I think those is able to really um, bring some business back and optimism back. Yeah. Uh, Paul, uh, d let, let's say for yourself, you're, you, uh, I mean, Dubai remains the crossroads. Uh, you, you're, you're muted. Um, the Dubai remains the crossroads, but I, I do wonder, what do you, what do you do next? What do you need? next either from government or from airlines well what we want to see richard is governments move out of risk avoidant mode into risk management mode and the difficulty at the moment no government around the world seems to be able to manage that triumvirate of medical security for their citizens on the one hand the ability to make sure that their social welfare of every population is looked after and that economic prosperity doesn't take a nosedive. And I think the difficulty so far is no one's really balancing those. We're seeing in Australasia, for example, a complete risk avoidance strategy with flights being cancelled with little notice, with borders being completely closed. And yet we are seeing in some other countries where they're not actually taking enough measures to control the spread of the virus and the economy is being put forward. The difficulty there is that um, they're not actually uh, cracking the problem, but, you know? But isn't that inevitable, Paul? I mean, if you look at the graph, if you look at the chart of cases over the year, so you go back to January, of last year, and you end up with this sort of nice little, well, not nice, you end up with this bump, and then it comes down, and we all thought it was that was that was it. And then you have the summer bump. And by so by the time you get to the end of the year and you've got this massive third wave, is it not inevitable that uh, and we'll come to you in a minute, Minister, that, that uh, people are going to be risk averse to the point of paralysis? Well, they are, but then if they are risk averse and they're doing the right thing, then hopefully we won't see that sort of degree of proliferation. Those countries that have got the vaccine program right fair and centre of their policies are absolutely making sure they're getting the balance right between the social distancing challenges of the population and they've got the populations obeying those challenges and have also got the risks around the economy managed are going to come out of this okay. And I think Israel, the UAE, the UK are all doing things in the right measure. Countries that have got out of balance are reaping the unfortunate consequences of that. Uh, Minister, I don't, I, without going into the sort of the, the, the wares and the wherefores of the uh, European vaccine challenges and issues at the moment, do you recognize what Paul is saying about this idea of risk averse versus risk management? Do you think that government should be more involved in risk management? We'll take John by piece and then Mark, if you want to come in after that. Thank you. Uh, I think it's not only a question of government. I mean, uh, people uh, now in their own life, uh, they, manage, they, they manage their risk. Uh, so that's why I think uh, the customer, uh, the tourist, uh, uh, for I think for some months uh, still uh, will be quite conservative, and I think that um, tourism will be uh, much more in a regional area. I mean, uh, Europeans within uh, the EU, uh, I, I think uh, Americans uh, in Northern America, uh, and so on. Uh, I think uh, next summer. Uh, will be more or less uh, this kind of tourism. Uh, so uh, when the vaccination will be uh, massive worldwide, uh, of course, it will be easier uh, for people to, uh, uh, to schedule, to plan, uh, 
uh, some uh, long, uh, long trip, longer trip. But uh, I think it's uh, it will be the business for uh, 2022 uh, and not not before. Uh, but as a government, uh, of course, uh, we, we we try to to manage um, um, to manage that uh, with a, a high increase of the vaccination. Uh, uh, Fifty percent of the population in France uh, will be vaccinated uh, uh, in, in June. Uh, so uh, we hope uh, that there is the, the light uh, uh, in the tunnel. Um, but I think that uh, behavior of the, of the people uh, has changed, of course. Right. Well, Mark, before you just answer, when you answer this, can you also just say, where do you stand on this idea of requesting versus requiring versus mandating employees at hotels where possible to be vaccinated? Um, I, let me take that question first, and then I'll, I'll also add to what the minister had to say about um, government involvement. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we are informing our employees of the, of the vaccines that are available. We are encouraging them strongly to become, to get vaccinated. And we will, uh, we have been, and we will continue to make time available for people to go do that. Um, and uh, and so that's that's really what our mandate is at this point. We are not requiring people to do so. We do think that over time we will end up with a um, identifiable, self-identified group of people who have decided not to become vaccinated, and that's actually the key to be able to contact trace in the future. That is to have a relatively small number of people who can um, who we can identify and, and basically continue to test. I do think that some corporate customers, when we start to get corporate customers back and social groups back in our hotels, will actually want to know whether the people who are serving them are vaccinated or otherwise have a very recent test um, with respect to their uh, state of infectiousness. So I do think that somehow we will need to figure out a way to give them confidence that they're, they're dealing with people who are not infectious at the moment that they're, that they're serving them. With respect to government, um, you know, policies and so forth, frankly, we have to recognize that governments around the world have been in learning mode for the last 15 months. Um, the original response in the United States mirrored what a typical response to the flu, a typical rhinovirus, what might have been. And that's why there was all this focus on surfaces. You don't hear about surfaces anymore because coronavirus isn't actually transmitted that way. And but I guess what I would say, yeah, you can look back and, and beat, beat up the, the CDC and, and criticize them. But the fact is they were going on what they thought was a flu and realized that it behaves differently. The same, the same thing re relates to mask wearing. They didn't come out early and say it's mandatory. This is the key issue. Right. This is, they, they finally got there, but, and, and, and we didn't have much support from the federal government um, who did not take seriously mask wearing um, and also didn't mandate anything. So to me, I think the, the complexities are, are high. Uh, yes, there's fatigue, but concurrently with fatigue over time with respect to the lockdowns, thankfully we have an, a growing um, base of vaccinated uh, individuals around the world. And my, my hope is that people will, will recognize the pattern. I'll just give you one piece of data that I found fascinating. So during the first quarter of last year, China shut down. Subsequent to the first quarter, there were localized outbreaks in different cities. And we tracked, in, e in each case over the course of the entire year last year, the number of days it took for our occupancies in that city to recover to the pre-localized lockdown. At the beginning of that period, it was 80 days, 8-0, to recover. By the end of the year, it was less than 40. And the reason, I think, is because because people understand, people came to understand that they needed to take that localized lockdown very seriously, engage, completely, <laughs> completely shut down. And the minute that the government said it's over, they got back to traveling. And I think that conditioning and the responsibility that people have individually, will, they are also learning. And right. I think that's a good sign. Shelley, I'll give you a second. I just want to go back to the minister because you are nodding on that. Now, France has tried a variety of regional lockdowns, which have now just become wider lockdowns. 
Um, if you move forward, and bearing in mind you've got this 10 kilometer um, limit, but in the future, do you see do you see limited regional lockdowns or the ability to control that way? Do you see that as part of your strategy in the future? Okay, um, well, we, we tried uh, at the beginning to, uh, to have a proportionate and a localized uh, a response uh, to, 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 to the pandemic. So that's why we, we, we had this uh, local lockdown. Uh, and we are now, in a moment uh, where it's 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 useful to uh, uh, to have these uh, national measures uh, but uh, every single day uh, that is passing uh, we, we are hoping uh, to uh, reopen progressively um, our sectors uh, and our region of course so uh, i think I, I prefer now um, to be in a position to uh, to, to to prepare the the, the end of this uh, episode um, and i hope that in the future uh, it won't be necessary again uh, to uh, to have a local lockdown or anything. Uh, I, we hope that with the vaccination, uh, with um, uh, I mean all the the tools that we will have uh, in terms of traceability, uh, it will be easier uh, to uh, uh, I mean to uh, to come back to normal life. Of course, Shirley, um, I want to move forward on this idea of the the changing nature of the skill set. If we talk about, and again, we're looking at specifically about reopening now, the sort of people we're going to need. And in this, I will also be talking in a moment or two about the, the, the mental health issues, which I think are crucial in, in, in this regard. But Shirley, how do you see the fundamental change that's taken place in the workforce that you are going to require? Yeah, um, I would like to share a story. So what is really most interesting in Bali, um, where most people know, and is that what happens is that when you see this paralysis in tourism, you actually see a rise in agriculture. And um, what happens is a lot of workers returning to farming and fishing, and some of them are coming more, uh, becoming more innovative in a way how they actually use traditional means to make a living. So for example, some people are going to seaweed farming and they are thinking about how to make it sustainable uh, for the long term. But what I really see is that- Can I just, ask, you, can I just ask you, Shirley, have you lost yeah. those people for good in the industry or do no, you think I, they will come back? I think what they are aware is this awareness of income and skill set diversification. So there was like an introduction to answer your questions that people are realizing that they need more than one skill set to survive just because any sector could be drastically impacted. Um, and so what, what we see as a, a rise is actually this digital workforce. And I think there's a lot of virtual experiences uh, that uh, the rise of virtual tourism will become sort of like a key going forward. So in Jakarta, some of our wedding uh, done virtually and on, in real life, and people are realizing they don't have to fly to attend a wedding party. And so the, the need for this digital communication, virtual experiences and social organizing are, 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 are some of the jobs that, that is required and some of, we are helping some of our people, people then towards that. Uh, Paul, I do wonder if I take Dubai, of course, your the, the majority of people are, it's an imported workforce to start with. Um, that creates an issue for you, firstly, in terms of vaccination, going backwards and forwards to home countries. Second of all, um, just in terms of people having returned, you know, as numbers have gone down, returned to their countries of origin and may not be willing to return back to Dubai. How are you going to rebuild your workforce? I think there's two things there, Richard. I mean, first of all, more than 75% of our workforce has now been vaccinated, and that's a requirement. And those that can't be vaccinated or don't want to be vaccinated are PCR tested every week. So we're taking absolute uh, draconian steps to make sure no one gets in front of a customer unless they've taken the appropriate measures. One of the things I think a lot of industries have now done, and that is taken the opportunity to eliminate 
customer facing bureaucracy for which we've needed thousands of people in the past. So things like check-in is now touchless. You can uh, enter and leave Dubai with, without showing your passport. Now we've got iris and facial scanners to determine identity. So it's accelerated the technology that will replace some of those jobs that have been quite bureaucratic in front of the customer before. So I think one thing across the whole uh, travel and tourism industry, as well as other industries, is actually this will accelerate some of the automation that was going on to eliminate some of those um, slightly more administrative tasks that we were doing in front of our customers in the past. So we will not be employing the number that we were employing in the past, that's for sure. And those we do employ, we will make absolutely sure operate in a workplace where they're fit to deliver customer service, which will be their primary focus without any risk at all to the customer. And we're sanitizing everything around the airport right. to almost hospital operating theater levels of uh, clinical um, sanitization. So there's a huge number of changes that this has brought about. And I think some of them will, will last for a very long time to come. I just want to touch, that, that's fascinating. I mean, particularly that point that you mentioned that the numbers won't be as great or the employee numbers won't be as great and the work they'll be doing. Um, Mark, the, the mental health aspect of, of all of this, it is easy or easy maybe is the wrong word. It is, we, we often decry and deny mental health as being um, a, a, you know, legitimate, uh, unless you've got a, a disorder, uh, a medically recognized disorder. But the fact is the sheer stress and strain that we've all been through has caused many of us, myself included, to sort of sometimes feel that you just can't keep going at this sort of pace. How aware are you of that and what are you doing about it? Uh, Richard, this is a critical issue. I'm glad you raised it. Um, it is, we are acutely aware of it. It's become a, um, a key area of focus for us because even as much as at the beginning of this pandemic, the focus was on physical well-being. Uh, it became very clear very quickly that holistic well-being is actually what we needed to focus on because, as you said, the stresses and strains, the, the psychological and emotional stresses that people have endured, and, and, the, and the personal loss, the human loss as well. Many family members, unfortunately also colleagues of ours um, who passed away from COVID, um, leave a tremendous burden and um, and, and stress level uh, for those who are left behind. So we started um, pretty early doing daily check-ins that did not just uh, relate to COVID symptoms, but also related to how people were feeling. Um, we then worked with a, a major teaching university here in the United States and now have deployed a, um, a web application, which is essentially a diagnostic tool that was developed for frontline medical workers to um, and help, help people self-diagnose whether they've got particular issues with respect to stress, sleep, anxiety, and depression. Um, and what we found, uh, we've had over 8,000 colleagues uh, use this tool to date. But have you, can I, have you created, have you created space yeah. where people can feel that they can say, I need some time without, you know, top management either fearing that their, you know, that their career is being derailed or that they're having a full nervous breakdown. That important space where people just simply say, I need some time for me. Have you created that? Yeah. Richard, thank you for saying it that way. Um, there's still a stigma associated with, with expressing oneself if, you, if you're having... Uh, if you're experiencing something for which you think you need time or you know you need time, um, the way we're, and so I'd say we are, we are absolutely providing it when we can identify it. And the way to open that up, we believe, is to have leaders in the company talk about their own experiences. So I've talked about my own experience with respect to the stresses that I've, I have experienced over the course of, of last year and what I needed to do for myself as a means of helping people to say, to be able to express themselves. But it, you said it earlier, 
there is still a stigma associated with this and people still believe that it's a sign of weakness. So we need to overcome that in order to really be uh, sensitive to and then do something about uh, what, we per what we can understand our um, real needs. Right, so let's look at this across the world that we've got here. We've got a nice cross section. Mark, give us sort of the, 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 the global US perspective, but surely in Asia, in ASEAN, where arguably mental health issues are not as, as, as developed in terms or recognized as perhaps they are elsewhere in the world, that does, that, that's perhaps a prejudiced view, but that's how it seems to, 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 to me. But let me say, if somebody says to you, if a GM says to you, or that would go to the company, but if, if you hear that people just need space, how willing are you, bearing in mind financial pressures, to accommodate that? Yeah, um, so interestingly, I, I do have GM that family member passed away um, um, during COVID and we did give them time off. Um, but what is interesting in some places in, in, uh, in Asia, ASEAN, like, uh, like Indonesia and Thailand, is it's a very community and village-like culture. People take care of one another. So I think the sense of community is very important that, that if somebody is not feeling so well, other people will just give them space and step in. And um, so you don't really have to face the issue alone. And um, so, so but, but in Singapore, the culture is, is a little bit different from the rest of the ASEAN. So there are a lot of helpline being set up and um, the television run uh, advertisement to say the government run advertisement to say that if you are facing with this that please call this line there will be people yeah. ready to help you so so i guess i guess it, it gives rise to the need for community support uh uh for us to, is is to just really champion for me i, I just champion um, the sense of really trying to support the people wherever they are, whether is it with loss of life, loss of job, uh, or, 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 or just support their well-being. Minister, at, at the end of the day, how much of this do you see in terms of a permanent shift? And again, we're focusing on the people involved rather than the travel. I mean, we know sort of anywhere between but bill gates says 50 percent of business travel won't come back well let's not discuss or argue about whether it's 50 percent, 30 percent or whatever we know that a percentage won't come back and we know that the industry will operate at a lower level for some considerable time um the the imf said last week that it saw no long-term permanent scarring for developed economies, which I thought was an extraordinary uh, position to be taking at this point. But as a minister, how much are you preparing for an industry that will look very different? Or do you believe recovery will come faster and, 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 and be, be, be quicker? Okay. Uh, I think that with this pandemic, uh, people adopted their, uh, their behavior, uh, of course, uh, uh, they cut the, the trips uh, the, uh, very long. Uh, the, 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 uh, they prefer to go, uh, I mean, uh, in the country, uh, discovering uh, again. So I think there will be uh, an appetite for uh, maybe what is called slow tourism. Uh, uh, of course, uh, people will continue to uh, make some, some, some long trip uh, uh, to discover during two or three weeks uh, uh, um, far away destinations, but I think that for for the weekend now uh, it there will be maybe uh, less uh, uh, urban weekend uh, in uh, European cities. Uh, people will maybe focus uh, on their own uh, uh, maybe uh, community um, uh, with this kind of, of staycation, and and many territories in France are uh, uh, putting some. Uh, um, uh, I mean, some, some euros in order to, to favorize uh, the, this kind of, uh, of tourism. Uh, and there will be, a, I, I mean, a, a renewal for some destinations such, such as uh, Mountain, for example. Mm -hmm. It was very hard for them this winter because uh, it was closed. It was not possible to, uh, to make ski. Um, but uh, last uh, summer, and I think for the 
coming summer also, uh, people uh, will uh, uh, prefer this kind of destinations with uh, very beautiful landscape and so on. So mm -hmm. I think maybe this kind of evolution, uh, I mean, uh, uh, greener attitude to the to 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 uh, to the trip. Right. Final question uh, issue that I want to just quickly go through everybody with before we finish: the green passport, the travel vaccine passport. The um, in a nutshell, Paul, are you in favour of requiring vaccination, or I suppose a PCR test? as an alternative for those who can't be vaccinated to travel. You know, the travel pass, the IR to travel pass, the common pass, the green pass of the EU. I don't think it's something for the industry, actually. I think it's more about border control. And if governments see the, the passports as the mechanism for opening up their borders, then I think that's a good thing, because I think whatever gets travel moving again is clearly good for the industry and good for the social and economic well-being for the four billion people that have been under some sort of lockdown over the last year. So I think if that's a mechanism that governments seek um, to introduce in order to get travel moving again, yes, of course, we're we are trial members of the IATA green passport system and very supportive of it. Mark, can you ever see a day where guests at your hotel have to show either a vaccine certificate or travel pass type of arrangement or agree to a lateral flow um, or a PCR before they uh, check in? Uh, I, don't, I don't believe so. I think the key in the management of something that is more <laughs> likely than not going to become endemic uh, is that we focus on identification of infectious individuals and have an effective uh, contact tracing pr process. We've seen it demonstrated in places like China, South Korea, uh, very effective. Um, it has not been possible in Europe or in the United States for since the beginning of the pandemic because the case rates are so high. But post-vaccination, uh, once, once we get to herd immunity, we right. the numbers of people who won't be vaccinated and therefore subject to being infectious is going to be low enough so that we can actually have an effective way to do that. But I don't see it being a requirement to travel. I just want to ask finally, each of you, we're going to start with Shirley. Shirley, what do you think you've learned over the pandemic? And, and, and I don't mean that we've all learned more about COVID than we ever wish we'd ever know. But as an owner, as a CEO, what have you learned about yourself and how you have responded to this that has either surprised you, disappointed you? What about you? So I guess in the beginning of the pandemic, um, uh, the, the, the first thing that happened to me is I actually lost someone very close to me. And, um, and not due to COVID, uh, but I actually lost my father uh, over the course of last year. So it was a time that you truly evaluate your priority as to what really matters um, uh, for me and, and what, are the, what are the issues that you really, I, I really want to live for and address. So I think that was uh, very important. And, and, and to me, the, the part that I feel most passionate about was that I really see a lot of uh, the K-shape with the K-shape recovery and the people who are suffering proportionately are actually the poor. And I'm living in a country of Indonesia with a lot of massively poor people. The question is to how to think about all the informal workers, rural communities, how they could actually get more support um, and how can I build social infrastructure that allows them to actually live much more resiliently and one of the things that I learned is, is, is really that I, I, when I began to look through my management system for people who are being affected economically by pandemic, uh, actually the poor can be the most resilient because they right. go back to farming. They go, I mean, their economic structure right. is so flexible that they, they, that they are more resilient in that way. Minister, you are, I mean, I, I suppose the health minister in, in France bears the, the greatest burden. The finance minister has to pay for it all. 
the president has to keep the, the whole show on the road. But in some senses, you're now going to bear the burden of one of the most important econo- uh, sectors of the economy, which is tourism and getting it started. Now, never mind the business side of it. What have you learned about yourself during this pandemic? Uh, I think um, uh, it was very interesting because not, not, not me, not you, because all in the room table are aware of that. But many people uh, uh, became aware uh, of the way of the tourism sector. And this tourism sector, uh, I think, uh, was seen as a very comprehensive one um, with many uh, uh, shops uh, that are selling thanks to tourists. Um, and so, I think it's the first lesson for many leaders in the countries. Uh, so that's why the president of the Republic uh, himself uh, several times uh, addresses uh, tourism sector. Uh, and I think it's, it's a move uh, in, in the, in the uh, public policies uh, in France, for example. And I think from the, uh, the, the, the personal point of view, uh, we saw how um, tourism, Uh, is a a way of life, uh, I would say, because um, it was very easy before uh, just to have a break, uh, uh, to discover a a small city, going in a small restaurant. And now uh, I feel like the the former smoker who who stopped (laughs) and who want to to smoke again. Uh, I have the same feeling uh, when I cannot go uh, to the restaurant. So I think uh, we, we, we saw it's part of our personal identity. Uh, I mean, uh, the fact to, uh, to meet other people, to exchange uh, and to share moments uh, that remain uh, uh, I, like, uh, I mean, uh, jewels in, in our uh, uh, head. Paul, what have you learned about yourself through all of this? I mean. Well, the busiest airport in the world, suddenly virtually shut shop, now reopening. Never mind the facts and the figures. What about Paul Griffiths? What have you learned about yourself? Well, the first thing I think is leaders of any business have to give direction. And I think for the first time, many leaders are experiencing the need to provide leadership to vast numbers of people based on very, very little information. And that's been a big challenge. Secondly, There's absolutely no substitute for decisive behavior in the absence of facts. Third thing is we've had to look after people from a social perspective in a way that has been far more intensive than before. And lastly, maintaining a sense of optimism. Travel and tourism, as we know, is an aspirational product. People are missing their mobility, as the minister was just saying. And we have to keep the aspiration alive that we will get back to making the world move and making the world economically, socially, and from a mental health perspective, a far better place. That's, I think, the the, the biggest thing. Keep that optimism alive that there is a future that looks bright. Mark, you get the last word. Um, What do you think as you shut hotels, as you opened hotels, as you realized you, as you weren't gonna have the same numbers in the future, what have you learned about yourself? Uh, I think the key learning uh, is the essential nature of human connection. Uh, to me, this uh, remote world has been um, a big lesson in how critical engagement on an interpersonal, on a human level is. And underlying all of that, I would say the sense of care, of kindness, and indeed grace of the human spirit is all powerful. A common theme there, without doubt, between all of your final answers, one of caring, yes, of community, of leadership. Um, And I'm so grateful that you joined us today to talk about this. We were very specific. We wanted to talk about it from an employment perspective to re-establish or to work out how many of the 100 million jobs can be brought back and can be saved. Minister, Paul, Shirley, Mark, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. I'm Richard Quest in New York.
Thank you to the WTTC for hosting this important panel.